Mosaic, a daily news program from Worldlink TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. Welcome to the News in Brief from Abu Dhabi Television. The U.S. hosted a meeting in Baghdad. Hundreds of Iraqis from various political parties participated in the meeting, planning for a post-war government. Hundreds of Iraqis, mostly Shiites, demonstrate, protesting the Garner meeting in Baghdad, saying that the religious figures in Najaf are not appropriately represented, adding that the Shiite parties participating in the summit do not represent the religious authority in Najaf. From Baghdad, our correspondent, Hany The political situation in Baghdad is tense. While Garner met with representatives of the Iraqi opposition, the Shiites held a massive demonstration to show their strong presence in the political arena. They are sending a direct message to the Americans. The religious authority must play a role in the future of Iraq. Their presence in the Iraqi streets demonstrates their desire to be considered in the future of Iraq. At the Syria base in Qatar, Rumsfeld discusses possible changes for the U.S. forces in the region before heading to Iraq and Afghanistan. Rumsfeld declares that the U.S. will remain present in these countries until democratic governments are formed. A Hamas member was killed by Israeli gunfire in the Jenin refugee camp north of the West Bank. Meanwhile, Israeli soldiers and Palestinian resistant fighters clash in Nablus while tens of Palestinians are being arrested in the West Bank. Saray al-Quds, the military wing of Islamic Jihad, warns the future Palestinian government of going after the Palestinian resistance fighters, arresting them or confiscating their weapons to implement the conditions for the roadmap. The initial results for the parliamentary elections in Yemen show that the ruling General People's Congress is leading the elections. There are tensions at the polling stations and accusations of election fraud. This is the end of the News in Brief. Welcome to the news from Abu Dhabi Television. The retired U.S. General Jay Garner, head of the U.S. Civil Administration in Iraq, presided over a meeting in Baghdad. 200 Iraqi delegates attended the meeting to discuss the future of the country following the collapse of Saddam Hussein's regime. The meeting was held under tight security at the conference center in downtown Baghdad. Garner said that the meeting launches the democratic process for the children of Iraq, noting that the meeting coincides with Saddam Hussein's 66th birthday. The first meeting to be held in Baghdad following the collapse of Saddam Hussein's regime. U.S. officials want to pave the way for an Iraqi government, where some of the participants suggested a presidential council rather than having one president. This important mission was assigned to the retired U.S. General, Jay Garner, head of the civil administration in Iraq, after Baghdad fell in the hands of the U.S.-led forces. The meeting hosted top political, religious, and tribal figures trying to plan the political future of Iraq. A number of tribal chiefs, the two main Kurdish organizations, representatives from the Iraqi National Congress, and the Islamic High Revolutionary Council, which is a Shiite organization based in Iran, all attended the meeting. Some of the delegates used the meeting as an opportunity to express their appreciation to the coalition forces' work in Iraq. They want us to forget the extraordinary role played by the United States of America and the United Kingdom in saving the Iraqi people from Saddam's dictatorship. Appreciation to the U.S. and British forces in Iraq was also expressed by another delegate, but in a different manner. The coalition forces searched us the same way we were subjected to searches in our country under the dictatorship. The attendees were a little more than 200. However, the attendees of this meeting exceeded the number of those who attended the first one held on April 15th in Al-Nasiriyah, only a few days after the collapse of the former regime. 
In the Al-Nasiri meeting, they passed a bill containing 13 articles supporting democracy and law and order. U.S. forces came under heavy fire in the northern Iraqi city of Mosul on Monday and retaliated by sending helicopter gunships into action. A correspondent said two U.S. Army positions came under sustained heavy machine gun fire on the western side of the Tigris River and hit back with heavy machine guns before calling in helicopter gunships. It was not immediately clear who had launched the attack, but army units received reports from civilians on Monday that paramilitaries loyal to Saddam Hussein were preparing an attack on the toppled president's 66th birthday. U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld said on Monday that the United States will reduce its military forces in the Gulf now that Iraq no longer poses a threat to the region. He said although no final decisions have been made, Army General Tommy Franks is thinking about changes in U.S. basing requirements in the region, including a possible move of Air Operations Command Center from Saudi Arabia. Earlier, Rumsfeld had visited U.S. troops serving at the coalition headquarters at Asalia, heaping praise on them for the victory in Iraq. Rumsfeld and General Tommy Franks shook hands and had pictures taken with throngs of soldiers at the coalition military headquarters as Salia in Qatar. Speaking to reporters, Rumsfeld assured that the United States had no intention of establishing long-term bases in Iraq and that its troops would only stay as long as they were needed. Palestinian Prime Minister-designate Mahmoud Abbas has threatened to refuse an invitation from American President George W. Bush unless President Yasser Arafat is free to travel abroad. Abbas's sudden display of solidarity with the veteran Palestinian leader came just a day before he was to present his new cabinet to the Palestinian parliament for approval. Bush had promised to publish the internationally endorsed roadmap as soon as Abbas is installed at the head of his reformist cabinet. The roadmap sets out stages to end the 31-month conflict and create a Palestinian state in less than three years. A U.S.-led meeting bringing together hundreds of Iraqis of all political stripes opened in Baghdad on Monday as part of plans for a post-Saddam Hussein government. The retired U.S. general running post-war Iraq, Jay Garner, told the delegates he and his staff would be giving them the tools and resources to restart the process of government. But Iraqis are growing angry with the U.S. occupation as the U.S. has not set a date for when it will hand over power to a future government. And in a further challenge to the Americans, thousands of Iraqi Shia Muslims were in the streets of the Iraqi capital in a mass rally to demand a separate national Congress to chart the nation's political future far from U.S. interests. Under a U.S. blanket, Iraq's various political stripes met on Monday in Baghdad as part of plans for a post-Saddam Hussein government. Around 250 tribal chiefs, Shiite and Sunni clerics, Kurdish leaders and other invitees attended the two-hour delayed meeting led by Jay Garner, the retired U.S. general and the governor of the U.S. occupation of Iraq. Garner told the delegates he and his staff would be giving them the tools and resources to restart the process of government. A senior U.S. official said the meeting was less of a political gathering, but a chance to look for emerging personalities to lead the Iraqi people in a future government. The reason I'm here, and General Tim Cross, my deputy, is here. is to create an environment in Iraq which will give us a process to start a democratic government. 
which represents all people, all religions, all tribes, all the ethnics, all professions. But the majority of Iraqis who oppose the U.S. occupation argue that the United States wants to appoint Iraqi leaders who would act as guardians for the U.S. interests in the region. Garner says the U.S. wants to hand in power to the Iraqis as soon as they are eligible to run a government. But till now, the United States did not set a timetable for when it will hand in power. We want representatives of the Iraqi people. Just we want that. Not, not a, a government that formed by American administration. But Jay Garner, who Jay Garner to form the, the government? Does he, ha does he have the right to, go to form this government to rule the Iraqi people? Do you think that? Streets of the Iraqi capital were overcrowded with thousands of Iraqi Shiite Muslims who marched in a mass rally against the U.S. occupation. Protesters demanded a new national conference led by dozens of religious leaders from the powerful Hausa religious Shiite school in the southern holy city of Najaf. Yes, yes to Islam, they shouted as they marched to al Firdaw Square amid tight security measures. Those participating in the meeting have nothing to do with us and we don't know them. Our real representatives are the Hausa Shiite leaders, not outsiders. The Hausa lived with us under Saddam. They broke bread with us. They felt our pain. They must take part in the meeting. The United States faces a dilemma concerning political aspirations of Iraqi Shiites who constitute 60% of the population. On one hand, future government cannot be formed without a major Shiite presence. And on the other hand, the U.S. fears that the Shiites will push for an Iranian-like government. AFP news agency said that among the delegates on hand were representatives of the Iraqi National Congress as well as the main Shiite faction, the Supreme Assembly of the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, which boycotted the first U.S.-sponsored meeting two weeks ago. It was not immediately known if Ahmed Chalabi, the head of the National Congress, would attend. Officials from his gathering declined to confirm the group would participate. The two main Kurdish factions which have controlled most of northern Iraq were also present. Iraqi Kurdish leader of the Kurdistan Democratic Party, Masoud Barzani, was also in Baghdad for the first time since Saddam Hussein was ousted. A KDP official who asked not to be named said Monday's gathering could be undermined by a separate meeting of Iraqi political figures which would be held Wednesday in the Iraqi capital. Our correspondent in Iraq, Mohammed al Kadhim, visited the Iraqi intelligence center in the city of Karbala and reported that homeless Iraqis are now dwelling in the place by which most residents were afraid to pass. He also reported that search attempts for the corpses of prisoners underground are now completely over after the U.S. occupation troops had neglected the issue. Iraqi Al Mukhabarat or Iraqi Intelligence Center, a place which evoked fear for most residents in the area. They surely were frightened to pass by this place. What if they were to enter it? Some residents of the holy city of Karbala in central Iraq told us they spoke with some prisoners who were under the rubble of these buildings, bombed by missiles launched by US warplanes, rendering them piles of debris. No one managed to save these prisoners after water leaked into these cells. This man spoke about a long crypt. This is its entrance, he said. It leads to an underground hole from where voices were heard. But it was not possible to reach them in the first days of war. Then the voices faded. Now few visitors come to the prisons. As time elapsed and all came to be aware that the prisoners are all dead by now. <laughs> The 
There were some people there, but they weren't visitors. Many civilians who had no shelter claimed the center. They got their families to live in this shattered building. Those who are dwelling in this terrible building gather the blocks from the rubbles and build themselves a shelter after years of life in the open air. Now, more than seven families live in this deserted place. As hopes that the economic sanctions would be lifted from Iraq, the dinar is reviving, returning to its price before the war. The ratio of the Iraqi dinar to the United States dollar is an indication of the Iraqis' confidence in future economic developments. However, this was not the only sign. The Iraqi dinar has returned to the same level as before the war. As Iraqis began selling dollars again, to buy their necessities. This was encouraged by the Iraqi life returning to normal and the people's hope that the United Nations will soon lift sanctions that have destroyed Iraq's economy. Many Iraqis stored food and other supplies before the war. Now these storage supplies have been depleted, resulting in the dealing of foreign currency. Meanwhile, U.S. officials say that trade in Iraq will be conducted using dinars, dollars, and other currencies until the new Iraqi government decides on the fate of the Iraqi currency. A Palestinian man was martyred by the occupation forces in Jenin. Israeli forces conducted a massive arrest campaign against Palestinian ranks in an attempt to prevent further martyrdom operations. With more details from occupied Jerusalem, we turn to Nasr al-Laham. Israeli soldiers dispersed along the border of Tul Karam and other western areas in an effort to prevent Palestinian martyrdom attacks in the cities of Natanya, Al Qader, Kfar Saba, and Baita Tikva. This morning, clashes occurred between occupation forces and Palestinian activists in the Balata refugee camp. Three occupation soldiers were injured, and four Palestinian Palestinians were arrested, among whom were Amr Sawalfa, a Fatah activist, and Alam Jaffi, a Popular Front activist. They were attacked by Israeli occupation forces who wanted to prevent further operations after the martyrdom operation by Ahmed al Khatib in Kafar Saba last Thursday. The violent and aggressive clashes took place in Jenin a day after the killing of 17 year old Musad Jaber, wounding four others. An Israeli occupation army spokeswoman said that the clashes took place as the Israeli army tried to surround the resistance fighters. The spokesman said that they captured Anwar al-Qaisi, an Islamic Jihad activist in Jenin. In the past few hours, the occupation soldiers conducted an aggressive arrest campaign in the West Bank, where 33 Palestinian young men were detained and 98 workers were prevented from crossing the Green Line for work. Many people believe that the Legislative Council's approval of Abu Mazen's government may strengthen the Palestinian position in its negotiations. Today, however, Israel's Prime Minister outlined new demands and imposed many conditions on the Palestinians. Occupation forces are trying to impose their conditions on the Palestinian Authority to arrest resistance fighters, try them in court, confiscate their weapons, stop weapon smuggling, and prevent further armed operations. Sharon continues to make these demands, but Mahmoud Abbas and his government may never be able to implement them. According to Palestinian public opinion, the only solution is to stop the authority from preventing these armed operations. Nasser al-Laham occupied Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to our news for tonight, and happy Easter for everyone. The Christian communities which follow the Eastern calendar in Syria celebrated today Easter through holding masses 
in Damascus and Aleppo. More in the following report. The Christian communities which follow the Eastern calendar in Syria celebrated today Easter by holding masses in churches. Usual celebrations were not held this year because of the tragic situation through which the Arab nation is passing, especially in Iraq and Palestine. In the Church of Mar George for the Syriac Orthodox, Patriarch Zakai was the first, the Bishop of Antioch and the whole East for the Syriac Orthodox and the supreme leader of the Assyriac Church presided over a mass to celebrate this occasion. In his sermon, Bishop Awaz talked about the sublime meanings of Easter, expressing complete support for Iraqi and Palestinian people in their battle of liberation. He expressed pride in the firm and principled stance of Syria, led by President Bashar al-Assad towards the Arab causes of destiny. Similar masses were held in the city of Aleppo to celebrate the great occasion. A mass was held at the Patriarchate of the Assyriac Orthodox in Aleppo, headed by Bishop Ibrahim of the Assyriac Orthodox Church. In his sermon, Bishop Ibrahim denounced the accusations directed against Syria and spoke highly of her principled stance. In the Roman Orthodox Patriarchate, Bishop Paul Yazigi presided over a ceremony. The sermon read highlighted the national cohesion Syria lives under the leadership of President Bashar al-Assad. In occupied Palestine, the birthplace of Jesus Christ, all signs of celebrations were absent during the Easter holiday following the continuous Israeli aggression against the Palestinian people. Israeli forces arrested three Palestinian citizens in the West Bank following an incursion into the city of Qalqilia. A heavy curfew was imposed on the city. Meanwhile, a Palestinian judicial institution concerned with the affairs of Palestinian prisoners and detainees revealed today that Israeli authorities follow a systematic campaign of deportation against the Palestinian prisoners. Lawyer Fatima al natish said that she visited 45 Palestinian prisoners during this month in the detention camp of Beit Aril in the occupied territories and was informed that an urgent pledge was presented to her to stop all arbitrary deportation acts against them, particularly the setting up of trials in absentia. They urged the international community to work hard in order to improve their living conditions inside jails. What are the U.S. motives to expand the list of targeted countries, and what countries will be targeted next? More in the following report from Salah al-Azraq. After the September 11th attacks, people expected a massive U.S. response that would violate international law. In an attempt to maintain the prestige that the United States has built for itself after Pearl Harbor since the 1940s, the American retribution campaign began against a weak and devastated country, Afghanistan. The superpower country managed to take control of Kabul, and then it created international legitimacy for that war, despite the large number of civilian casualties. Before capturing Taliban or Al-Qaeda leaders, the United States forces were moved to another area to continue the path of retribution. Like in Afghanistan, the United States forces had their way in Iraq. Before capturing the wanted Iraqi officials, and Saddam Hussein in particular, the Americans were talking about what will be next after Iraq. It is said that the American list is long, but political analysts agree that the list is actually confined to the Middle East region. The American threats that are targeted against North Korea are only an attempt to make it appear that the United States is not only targeting the Middle East. 
ولا يستبعد هؤلاء أن تكون لبنان وسوريا الهدف. لبنان وسوريا might be the primary targets, allowing Israel to be surrounded by peaceful countries, either by military intervention or by signing peace agreements with the Zionist regime. Political analysts speculate that Israel may participate in the next war along with Washington to eliminate both the Palestinian and Lebanese resistance, in addition to removing or disciplining defiant governments. If that happens, then the next alliance would probably be between the United States and Israel. وإذا ما صح ذلك فإن التحالف الحرب المقبل سيكون أمريكيا إسرائيليا بدرجة أولى ليتراجع Britain may stay out of the next war because many of its officials are opposed to expanding the war. Political analysts also seem to agree on the United States objectives in the Middle East, which are controlling the oil, weakening the Arab national bond, confronting growing Islamic movements, and fighting terrorism the American way. which include eliminating the Lebanese resistance, which is primarily Hezbollah, in addition to the political resistance and the political groups that are opposed to Oslo in particular. The government that supports these resistance will also be eliminated. The net result will make the Middle East totally subservient to Israel. U.S. campaign to get dominance over other countries is not confined to waging wars on some of them. There are many schemes afoot in vast dimensions to smooth the ground for the United States to gain control over the world. Jenan's Saeed Tofiri further elaborates on this. Children enjoy a colorful world full of toys and dolls. You want a piece of proof? Drop by a toy shop and see a variety of toys from different countries on display. For a few decades, U.S. cartoon icons have found their way into other continents. Soft toys like Mickey Mouse and Teddy Bear are now familiar faces around the world, all trying to win the hearts and minds of children. Moving on to the world of war, items like a delicately designed pistol led kids to the world of violence. And on the screen, children practice virtual combat, which mainly ends up in the defeat of the U.S. foes. Domination of public opinion is the key feature of the U.S. cultural campaign, which is not confined to a certain group. For different societies, the prescriptions are different as well. Now I take you to a different place to show how the campaign deals with the world of pen and paper. Fresh English learners pick up new words to express themselves in a new language. From the very beginning, the choice is made between American or British accents. Could you tell us what's your favorite accent? Uh, British. Uh, American. American. No sign of interest in Irish, Australian, or even British-derived accents like Welsh in this small classroom. The U.S. cultural designs are to blame, the teacher says. It can be part of their cultural program. After two years, the same person who has now learned a new language to the point that he can um, communicate. He can read, he can write. But books like this are trying to hammer the American culture into the new audience in the name of learning a new language. The same formula is in the working for Iraq. With the Anglo-American war coming to a close, the cultural invasion is the next episode of the show. How deep will it go? That is a question time will have to answer. Say to Firi, Tehran. Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which promotes journalism excellence worldwide and invests in the vitality of 26 U.S. communities and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support provided by Henry and Virgilia Dakin. <laughs>